Thank you for coming out to Rich Smith's talk. This is Pyretic, Reversing Obfuscated Python Bytecode and Live Python Objects. If you're not in the talk that you want to be, I would suggest that you stick around. This looks like it'll be a very cool talk. And now I'll turn it over to Rich. Okay. Uh, can everyone hear? Okay. It's a weird room because it's like a little wider than it is long. So I'll just be vacantly looking at both screens each time. Um, so as a, as a title of the talk says, we're going to be talking about reverse engineering at the Python layer rather than the C layer, which is what m more people are familiar with. Um, we're going to talk about why, in some cases, uh, reversing at the Python layer or at higher level languages is actually uh, more desirable than going straight down into the C or straight down into the assembly. So as you'll see from my swishy intro, um, we're going to talk uh, a little bit about Python language in general, some areas of Python that uh, people who program in it may not be so familiar with. Um, programming in Python and, and obviously how the underlying runtime works uh, is, is fairly different. So uh, we're going to cover some fundamentals around the Python language. We're going to cover why are we even looking at reversing Python. Uh, we're going to talk about the anti-reversing uh, technologies and techniques that people are starting to put in place to stop people reversing out Python. Um, and then obviously we're going to talk a little bit about the toolkit that I've pulled together to um, you know, evade some of these uh, existing uh, anti-reversing techniques. And all being well, there'll be a demo that will work. So, why are we reversing Python? You know, what, why did we even bother with the task of going at the Python layer rather than just going straight down, dropping into the, a debugger and looking at C? Well, there was... Uh, a security posture of some applications, shall we say, that needed to be looked at. We wanted to look at how well the Python was being coded, not how well the runtime was being implemented. We want to assess the code of the Python application, not the C Python runtime itself. Um, obviously, working at the Python layer allows you to assess the application's code as opposed to looking at the underlying runtime's code. That's not to say that there aren't bugs in the underlying runtime that are worth finding, but <clears throat> it's a different task. And we found that a lot of the available tool sets worked fine on standard Python. You know, if it was standard bytecode that was produced in, uh, in the normal ways, the decompilers and everything that was around worked well. As soon as there was any attempt by the author of the code to try and change things around a little bit, to obfuscate, to do some anti-reverse engineering techniques, everything fell down. And that's mainly because um, there hasn't really been a huge amount of work done on this. Um, there hasn't been necessarily uh, a huge need because a lot of the Python code is obviously distributed in uh, its source code format as a .py. You don't need to reverse it. Um, but obviously, things are changing. People are using Python in increasing amounts, and people are using it for commercial uh, applications in increasing amounts. So, if we look in a general case, you know, what are the what are the changes? What are the, are the trends? Well, none of this should be a surprise to anyone. People are moving away from C and C++ for exactly the same reasons that half of the talks at this conference are happening is because C and C++ is hard. People have to do a lot of their own management. They'll go to higher level languages. Um, obviously, Python's one example, but there's you know, a lot of people working in Ruby, Lua's being huge in the scripting uh, engines for games, etc. Uh, and a lot of the higher level things that we'll talk about today apply just as much to other high level scripting languages, and uh, in some cases, even uh, up to kind of C-sharp, .NET type languages. Um, so we're exemplifying it with Python. But you can take the principles and you can apply it to any other high-level languages. There's also been significant changes with how software has been distributed. Uh, five years ago, everything, you downloaded a binary and, you, and that was all the software. Now it's obviously software as a service, Web 2.0, the cloud, you know, all the new buzzwords. Everyone gives you a small client app that then goes into their service online. Uh, it's, you know, it's a portal. A lot of the logic is kept online. Uh, everybody has you know, REST APIs, etc. So there's a huge shift in how the software is actually being distributed. Um, this shift means that a lot of the reverse engineering methodologies and approaches also need to shift. There needs to be updated uh, thoughts around how the best way to go around reverse engineering in this new environment is with higher level languages, with more service oriented uh, distribution models. Um, overflows aren't the only bugs. There's a huge amount of bugs that can be very, very useful that aren't overflows, that aren't you know, Nico-style heap attacks. Uh, they are just you know, plain logic flaws in the source code of Python or Ruby or whatever. 
Um, and if you've seen any of the talks, uh, probably some later today, and certainly in the pro programmatic track yesterday, the return on investment, the amount of effort that needs to be put into reversing a modern memory corruption bug is huge. You know, six, 12 months worth of dedicated research time, that's expensive. Um, if you can do three weeks of research on a bug and get just as much leverage, then you've got a much, much better ROI than you had before. A lot of tools, techniques, very C-centric. You know, everyone's come up through the, uh, through the schooling of there's a, uh, a, a compiled binary and it can't go back to where it came from without a lot of work. Obviously, modern languages are all reflective. You distribute the binary, you're actually distributing the source code with that binary because you can reflect it all out via the properties of the language. Um, a lot of the tools, certainly when you're looking for Python or Ruby or anything like that, a lot of the tools that exist work, uh, that just work at that layer too low. You don't want to know necessarily all the DLLs that are being called into. You want to know the uh, logic which is at the application layer. Um, and obviously, there's a huge reliance on actually having physical access to the binaries. You know, those binaries need to be on your disk for you to be able to reverse them. Um, so these are all the things that, in an approach to reverse engineering, we need to understand and evolve to keep up with, with the actual technological landscape which is evolving along with us. Um, I'm certainly, and uh, Dave has accused me of this many times, I'm fallen foul of being a bug snob. Um, you know, ref refusing to, uh, wanting to work on you know, CSRF type bugs or XSS type bugs because you know, they're web hacking bugs, it's not real hacking, it's what kiddies do. Um, but to be fair, if it gets you in, then it gets you in. You know, if you take six months to get in, or you can get in via a cross-site request forgery and it's taking you like two hours, then um, you know, that was a much better approach. And there's a huge amount of attack surface area open uh, on, on the, uh, the, <coughs> the non-overflow type of bugs, which are seen as less advanced. You know, people don't want to talk about them because they don't feel as cool. You know, they want to talk about the, the six months that they spent knee-deep in an assembler. Um, but there is a huge amount of low-hanging fruit in areas that people just aren't looking. Um, and I, depending which side of the fence you're on, it's either fortunate or unfortunate. Not everybody is a Nico. Not everybody can sit and do the things that Nico does with the heap. Um, I'd be there for three years and get nowhere near as far. I'd rather sit for six weeks and do something I'm good at. And I'm sure Dave would appreciate that time. He paid me much more. <coughs> so other side effects of this kind of new, uh, new uh, paradigms that we're seeing. Everything is always in beta. That means a lot of features are being tested out. That means that they're seeing both crowd reception. You know, how do people use the app? Do they like this? Do they think that they can monetize on this? Lots of things are rolling in and rolling out. Obviously, if anything's beta, that means it's generally less tested, more likely to have bugs in it. Um, the use of higher level languages means uh, the skill of a developer that needs to be uh, there to develop in that language is a lot, lot less. So they won't have the years of training and experience uh, of writing in a difficult language. Um, easier languages are good in many respects, but it also means that you'll get people who are uh, less, have much less understanding of actually how computers work. Um, you know, they may know Visual Studio and C Sharp, but that's you know, the bounding of their world. Um, and obviously, in an increasingly competitive technological market, the time to market is key. And you know, when you can get a feature out before your competitors is key. And if that means that you're going to do less QA, obviously, this is not news to anyone. Because of all this, obviously, it means that there's lots of bugs. One of the nice things with the kind of Web 2.0 style things is large populations of users, therefore targets, can explode almost overnight. If it's the new big thing, the new viral application, you will get a huge number of new people uh, that are potentially vulnerable to a bug that you found in code that's very untested. And certainly in a, in a platform, uh, in a Python bug, uh, if you do find a good bug, then it becomes cross-platform and cross-architecture. If, you know, if you find a bug in a particular version of, of, of uh, Windows, you have to do a lot of work to make that reliable across language packs, different service packs, uh, different versions of Windows. If you find it in a high-level language and it works, you've got a full cross-platform bug. The same code can work on an Android phone as works on uh, a MacBook. Now, that's great. I mean, again, talking about re uh, return on investment, one set of development and you've compromised everything that uses that code. And people use Python and high-level languages because it is cross-platform and they don't have to redevelop for all those platforms. So another thing just maybe to think about as going through is, you know, there's a lot of talk about, you know, we're, you know, we're more secure than ever. People have uh, put more effort into the security and their QA and their development processes than ever. But I think it really depends on what metrics that you're looking at. 
Um, if, you're, if you're looking at the number of lines of code, there's more lines of code than there's ever been. People who think they can code, there's more people who release code, who work for companies, and I'm sure you're all sitting there smiling, knowing that there's a bunch of people where you work that should never be let near a computer, yet they release development code. Um, Obviously, everything's a lot more connected than it's ever been. Everything now is Web 2.0. Everything has got to do something with the cloud. Um, and obviously, the pervasive technology just throughout life is more than ever. So when people are saying that we're winning the battle, obviously, out in the forum area, you'll get a lot of people telling you uh, via a lot of expensive snake oil that this will make you secure. Actually, when you look at the bigger picture, uh, that might not be so true. What won't be discussed, if my clicker will work, there will be no dropping of commercial application code or bugs from commercial application code which the tool has found. Um, the lawyers don't seem to agree that what goes on in Vegas stays in Vegas. They tend to uh, chase you after Vegas and then make your life hell. So uh, we won't be dropping any bugs today. Find your own bugs, use the toolkit. So what are all the good reasons for reversing a higher layer? You're closer to the information. You're not looking at the data which the intermediate runtime and therefore compiler created for you. You're looking at what the developer coded. And that's where the bugs are going to be. Um, we've already said that there are likely to be bugs in the runtime, and obviously there are bugs in the runtime. But the uh, easier bugs to find will certainly be from the 18-year-old you know, coder who's done his summer internship at the bank, and now that's their new application that is controlling everything uh, across their infrastructure. So obviously, if we look at. Uh, this is just a, a standard debugger, a Unity debugger, looking at some Python code. There's a huge number of layers between the actual Python code and the coder and how it executes in at the assembly layer. I'm not sure if you can see that very well, but you should be able to see like a bunch of calls into the Python, uh, Python 2.5 DLLs, just showing you that there's a huge amount of, of inference between you and the actual logic behind there. What's more interesting in my uh, point of view is obviously every language has its own quirks and flaws and, and weird ways of doing things. Um, you know, Python and high-level languages are no exception. C is obviously people have done years of research on how exactly the C implementation works. Um, Python is no different than this. There are weirdness uh, in Python and lots of people make uh, very key mistakes because the people that are programming in Python are often uh, uh, less savvy technically, uh, will see that the program seems to be working right, but don't necessarily understand how it's working properly uh, at the lower layer. So a couple of just kind of classic example bugs. Um, this kind of primitive, anybody want to shout out what the, glare, what the bug is in this bit of code? Anybody not too hungover to be able to shout for that? Correct, yeah. So we're talking, if you will click, we're talking a class versus an instant attribute. So the var variable is defined at the class layer. So this means it will be shared between all instances. Um, so you can see that we've, you know, uh, foo and bar, you would imagine that if you looked at foo var and bar var, you would have 10 and 20, but actually you have the coalescence between the two. Now, I mean, this is a silly example, but depending how uh, that object is used, that could give you leverage. Certainly in situations where it's uh, kind of a shared service, if that, uh, if that class is instantiated once and then children of that are set with different users, you can get access to other people's objects. Um, most developers, certainly most kind of Python-oriented developers, and if you add they're a web Python developer, they've got no idea about this kind of stuff. Another example, um, whoever over there who seems to know is Python and want to uh, shout out what's, what's wrong with this. Mutable default, exactly right. Um, so when you can see the call me there, uh, you call it, and it looks like it works exactly right. If you appended, you've appended foo onto the end of the, of the list, everything's great. However, if you call, uh, call the call me function without any arguments, the default argument is used. The default argument is created at uh, object creation time, not instantiation time. So you can see that two calls to that, uh, the same object is used, so it's appended to the list. Uh, again, depending on how this bug primitive is used, it can be very useful. I've seen um, uh, some lists like this where sockets, uh, socket objects are defined, and you can get access to a different socket object and take over a session. Um, again, not a bug that most uh, kind of Python developers would really be too aware of. And there's a ton. I mean, there's a whole other talk on ripping Python to pieces 
when you start to look at the code and start to look at other 